I did have this feeling where I was like, you know, movies are fine to make a little money, but I can't really, I don't love them. And then I got this script for Stranger Things. And I had this moment where I read that script and I was like, this is beautiful. Um, and this character is beautiful. And if they want me to play this character, there'd be no way I could cynically show up and sort of just like coast through it. Stranger Things. I had always been a guy in movies who was like, like six or seven on the call sheet, a uh, real supporting player. And I usually was the guy with the gun who was running after Denzel or Liam Neeson or whoever it was, you know, either a cop or a villain or whatever. And, uh, it was hard to put your heart into that stuff after a while because you're seen a certain way, you're edited together as a certain way and it just becomes a two dimensional thing. And I always, you know, got into acting to really create three dimensional characters. And on stage, I could still create those characters. You know, there was even a moment where there was a big movie that they wanted me to play like seven on the call sheet. And I, I was like, no, I want to go do Shakespeare in the park. You know? And the people, they couldn't believe it. They sort of, Hollywood can't believe when you turn them down in that way. So I, um, but I did have this feeling where I was like, you know, movies are fine to make a little money, but I can't really, I don't love them. And then I got this script for Stranger Things and I had this moment where I read that script and I was like, this is beautiful. Um, and this character is beautiful. And if they want me to play this character, there'd be no way I could cynically show up and sort of just like coast through it. And then once I got it and I started working on it, I found even more so, if I w was really gonna play this character, I had to just like put my whole self into it in a way that was different. And up until that point, I had understood that Hollywood uh, or movies were certainly about, you know, kind of how good you look I don't have a lot of the components of that person and th that person hasn't got me very far anyway. It's not like at 20, whatever, I was Chris Hemsworth, so good looking and strong and, you know, fierce that I was given these roles. I was kind of a guy who was, they were kind of like, yeah, even when you're, you know, sort of good looking and in shape, like we're not that impressed with you. And so I was like, all right, I may as well, because the one thing I can do is like I can act. And I was like, I may as well just like throw my soul into this thing. And I let myself go like, I'm just going to eat donuts like this guy would do and like go into this semi depression with this kind of clownish joie de vie that he has through that anger. I started smoking cigarettes and I was just like, I'm just going to play the hell out of this guy. And, like, and then I thought I'll be, you know, I'll be done and I'll go back and just do plays. And then it became like a huge success. And I was like, oh, wow, I can put my heart into things. And that rejuvenated my experience of film and TV where I was like, oh, yeah, you you can tell narratives that are important and that are three dimensional. David, you can do this. And that was a beautiful experience for me and life changing. And then Elle, she just slams the door right in my face. Uh huh. You know, it is that smug son of a bitch, Mike. He's corrupting her, I'm telling you. And I'm just going to lose it. I mean, I'm going to lose it, Joyce. Just take it down, Hopper. I need for them to break up. That is not your decision. They're spending entirely too much time together. My relationship to children in general has changed. And I think it's partially as a result of playing this character of Hopper, but also as a relation in relation to them. One of the things I love about them so much is just that they're actually kids. Like, they're great actors as well. But especially that first season, they were so awkward and unaware of themselves. I remember Finn in particular would just, like, do this thing with his body that only kids can do. Like, we're all so, we understand cameras are on us, but kids are still, uh, I don't know what's going on. I mean, I forget what it was like to be a kid, but it's just like you can't really control your body. Um, and I love that about them, that spontaneity and that purity and that naivete. In the beginning, I really tried to stay away from them because I felt like Hopper has a distant relationship with these kids. And as the series went on, even the first season, especially into the second, 
I started to fall in love with them and they really do feel like my family. And watching them grow up, I was scared in the beginning, you know. They got so famous and the papers do all kinds of things. And now I'm so proud of all of them in terms of their deft navigation of that world. And it was incredible to watch along the, pro along the way. I mean, one of the funniest, sweetest things was after the first season, Finn Wolfhard showing up in season two and like trailing the Duffer brothers around with headphones wanting to direct an episode that season. I was like, man, I was like a 14 year old kid, you know, and he was earnestly wanted to direct an episode of Stranger Things. And I was like, yeah, that'd be amazing. I'm not gonna let you give me any notes, Finn, but yes, I would love to see you direct an episode. What I wanted to say to you is that, um, uh oh, I think we're in trouble. So yeah, I've been, you know, I've been really proud of them. And it is this special relationship because they, I occupied a time in their lives that is so profoundly, you know, big. Like they were 11 to now they're like 17, 18. And that period of your life is so big. And so I think I occupy a special place in their lives as well. Uh. <laughs> you know what? Your mom called. What? Yeah. She needs you home right away. Is everything okay? No, I don't think so. And I do feel like when they show up on set, they're like, hey, David, like, I do feel like there's a certain, you know, fear, uh, respect of me that um, I no longer exploit. I used to. I just like that we have that uh, place in each other's lives. Hellboy. Hellboy was an interesting experiment for me. I still get a lot of love online, you know, in little DMs and little ways for that movie, which I really like now because the time it came out, it was very poorly received. And, uh, you know, it hurt because no matter what you're doing, whether it's received well or badly, I think you throw your whole self into it. We were well-intentioned in trying to make you know a new version of hellboy that was um as good as it could be and not being compared to that unfortunately we were i sat down with ron i loved what he did in those movies i loved those guillermo del toro movies and we just wanted to try something different i thought there was supposed to be three <laughs> There was a lot of stuff that was left on the cutting room floor in terms of my work on that. I mean, I did a lot of work that we didn't ultimately use. I wanted it to be very, very different. And it, you know, whatever the constraints were around me that didn't want that to be. I mean, I had all these things based on language where, you know, Hellboy's natural tongue is demonic. And in fact, there are things like uh, Anum Ung Rama that I felt like were demonic tongue. And then, you know, people that learn language, learn English at a, at a later age, like what those people are. I had all this like intricate, detailed character work. And don't sell final. Google translate that, would you? It's just some uh, friend told me, you know, like a prophecy. The most interesting thing about the whole experience for me I watched Frank Langella talk on a documentary about being Skeletor in the He-Man movie back in the 80s, which I think is the 80s. If you haven't seen the He-Man movie, it is quite an interesting movie. And Frank Langella is covered in prosthetics and, you know, just, just, it's, it doesn't hold, it's not a good movie. But he, he worked with Joseph Campbell unlike the mythology of that and coming up with the lines. And he loved Skeletor. He loved that character so much. 
I have sort of a similar experience to what, what happened with us with Hellboy. It was like, I think the movie's fun, but it, it our vision and our, our passion for it was very high. And then, you know, uh, life winds up giving you what life gives you. So uh, it was interesting. That's all I could really say. How do you have hair on your tongue? Mm -hmm. Black Widow. Yeah, I just loved it. I love Red Guardian. I love Black Widow. I love that whole world. It's sort of a combination and a culmination of all these other things. I mean, you have the enormity of the project, which is this Marvel Universe world where the sets are the best possible sets. Everything's just stunts. Everything is just the best of all worlds. And then you put at the heart of it Kate Shortland, who is really an indie very creative director who in the past has told some good stories about women coming of age and um and that was a beautiful juxtaposition <laughs> still fits hmm? family back together again you got fat it's many water weight. we had a lot of discussions about red guardian there there's a lot of complexity there i mean he is really kind of a silly guy but even the guilt around his own narcissism and how he did fail his children is interesting and kind of comes through in the movie. I also like the fact that I got really fat for it. And there's my favorite shot in the movie is like I'm running out of this prison and and my belly is moving like this in front of me like a, a bag of ferrets. <laughs> so it's not my own take, but uh, yeah. Revolutionary Road. Movies still felt to me like a very foreign world. Um, I, I had no plans to do them. My heart was really in New York theater and I thought that that was where I would be accepted as well. And the fact that I was accepted was like a dream come true. I mean, that's all I really wanted to do. It's all my ambition was. The interesting thing was Virginia Woolf actually sort of led to the screen career. Sam Mendes uh, saw me in that play and called me in when he was looking to put together the cast for uh, Revolutionary Road. And it was one of the most incredible moments of my life because I was just this theater actor in New York, you know, done a little, little bit of film, but I was certainly not known in any way. And my agent told me I had a meeting with Sam Mendes and I went in and I knew the book very well. It was like one of my favorite books. Um, and I said, you know, amazing that you're doing this movie, but I hope you don't mess it up because it's a really beloved book. And he said, yeah, I hope I hope we don't too. You're the only person I can think, think of in this role. And I was like, what? Like, I was like, who am I? Like, I'm just some guy in New York, like doing plays. I mean, I can't believe out of all the actors you could cast in a Kate Winslet, Leonardo DiCaprio movie that I'm like the only guy you could think of in this role. We're going to Europe. To Paris. Oh! <laughs> To live. When? In September. But what for? Because we've always wanted to. Because the, the, the kids are young enough. Because it's beautiful. I mean, really. I mean, Shep, you've been there. You, you, you tell her. Yeah, it's a great city. Throughout the years, my process has developed a lot. Uh, and that production in particular was really kind of a blur. Because I was so out of my element. I had only known Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio as being like a fan of these big, huge movie stars. And so there I was like in scenes with them. Um, it was very, you know, <laughs> confusing. I was sort of terrified. Uh, so what are you going to do, Frank? Well, I'm going to study and I'm, I'm going to read. Well, I suppose I'm going to finally figure out what I want to do with my life, Shep. While she supports you. Yes. But my process in terms of starting to work on him was that he had been a former military guy and he prided himself on that before he got lost in the suburban world. And so even talking with the costume designer, I was like, what would he be drawn to in a shirt in the shop if he was? And I thought he'd be drawn to more military type things. And so we had like pockets on his shirt, just 
little touches like that because he really does have this life that he has with these kids and this wife who and then he has this fantasy life with her which is about paris and you know he talks about the way she smells like i think it's like fresh linen and lemons or something i mean what kind of man is going to sit around his bathrobe all day picking <laughs> his nose while his wife goes out and I works i don't know shep i just don't know <sighs> Why are you crying? And then there are moments where, I mean, Shep, even in his name, to me, it evokes a puppy. It evokes like a dog. And, and I think there were elements of that animal kind of in him, this sort of faithful dog who could get very angry and who could also be naive and puppyish in a certain way. And I just played with that with Kate. April. This is what I've always wanted. I love you. Don't say that. The other great thing about him is he just would reveal his inner monologue. And there was even a scene where I walk out and I look over after my kids treat me like garbage. And I walk out and I look over our hill to their house. In the book, he just sits there and he says, I love you, April Wheeler. I love you, April Wheeler. And he just repeats it. Um, and so beautiful, like he's almost practicing how he's going to say it. In the movie, they cut that out and it's just him staring. But we shot all that. So, you know, there was a lot of like, a lot of playing around with these different elements. Hi. Brokeback Mountain. That was really a very early movie for me again, and it was something where I didn't really understand the medium as well. I had known Jake Gyllenhaal a little bit. You ever notice how a woman will powder her nose before she goes to a party? And then she'll powder it again once the party's over? I mean, why powder your nose? Just go home and go to bed. Oh no. He sort of understood that I didn't know that much, so he would sort of provoke me in various ways to help me understand film in that way. We'd be moving on and he'd say things like, ask for another, ask for another. And I'd be like, what do you mean? I, I, the director said he got it. He'd be like, no, ask for another. You want another, just ask for another. He's got a little uh, cabin down on Lake Camp. Got a crappie house, a little boat. Said I could use it whenever I want. We ought to go down there some weekend. Drink a little whiskey, fish some. It was a little scene, so there wasn't a lot to go on, but there was so much sort of packed in that scene. You know, the short story itself was so rich. I thought the movie was so beautiful, and it really wasn't about dialogue. It was about these little moments that Aang would create and allow to happen. You could tell that the movie was built on all these delicate little moments as opposed to big scenes with lots of dialogue. Um, and you felt that when you read it. So it didn't matter that there wasn't a lot for Randall. It felt very potent. Get away, you know? I feel like right from the very beginning, they can tell that they both have these needs. And even sitting on that bench was like a wonderful way to be there with the other character and just feel this need. And Aang really let us, you know, play that. I mean, when we shot it, it was very relaxed in terms of how the lines played out or what happened. And we could really just sit there and sort of take each other in and take in the importance of this moment. Quantum of Solace. Quantum was a whole other level in movie making that I'd never been a part of. The budget was like $200 million. Showing up in London at Pinewood, and it was called B-22 at that time. It was the 22nd Bond movie. They have their own stages. They have their own thing. I went in. I saw there was a set in some sewer with a car. I mean, just the sets were so magnificent and huge and the detail. I'd never really seen anything like it. And that, But, you know, even in the magnitude of this, the first day I got there... Oh, I talked to Mark Forrest, the director, who I just loved, because uh, he was such an indie director in this huge sandbox and had such love for even, you know, a smaller character like Greg Beam and really wanted me to play around. But the first day I got there, it was just Judy Dench 
behind glass, like doing this monologue. Like it was like three pages or something, just talking to Bond on the phone as she was behind this like computerized glass, I think. Oh, hi, this is Gregory Beam, ma'am. Hello, Mr. Beam. Uh, I'm so sorry to keep you waiting. We have no interest in Mr. Green. Thank you, Mr. Beam. Connection terminated. He's a person of extreme interest. The great thing about it was that Mark was such an indie director, so he was really in it for the creativity and, you know, the silly moments, especially with a character like this Greg Beam character. We played around with lots of different things. I mean, I think at one point, too, there's a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor of that that Mark and I just improv because it's like, you know, it's a James Bond movie. We're not going to like sit around with this, you know, CIA guy, Greg Beam, for a long time. But there were there was a party that Jeffrey Wright and I go to. We go to the villains like party at one point. And I think I went up to some lady and was like, uh, Beam. Greg Beam, like, you know, we were playing around all sorts of stupid stuff like that. Even the like fly, I think this actually is in the movie, but there's a moment where uh, Jeff and I are talking and he's going to go meet Bond and I had a fly swatter. Mark was like, wouldn't it be great if you had like a fly swatter and you could just like, you know, and, and that was like a fun little thing like that. And so do we have an understanding? Uh, yeah. We do nothing to stop a coup in Bolivia, and in exchange, the uh, new government gives America the least standing oil found. If it's oil you want. We didn't find diamonds, did you? <laughs> but yeah, it was just this mega movie that I had this minor role in, but he really invested a lot and made him this silly, uh, intricate version of i feel like of america to the brits like you have this super you know sexy british spy who's got it all together and you know even jeffrey wright on the lower level of the american cia is like you know helping him out and then like at the top of the chain is this kind of you know boorish very loud drunk and confident Guy. You don't need another Marxist giving national resources to the people, do you? No, well, we can hardly be expected to do something about a coup we know nothing about. I think the uh, absurdity of all that was, was fun to play. The newsroom. Elliot was great. I really liked doing the newsroom. The problem that I had with the newsroom was that everyone was so intelligent uh, in the newsroom and had such integrity. And I kept fighting for Elliot to be the guy who had no integrity and was not that bright. But unfortunately, Sorkin would uh, give me lines still that belied my intelligence. Although I think as the show went on, he started to <laughs> give me less of those lines. There's a race for state rep in Hutchinson, Kansas that defies cliche. The Democratic incumbent, Jan Pauls, is anti-gay. Gay marriage? A gay person, anti-gay. Tonight, Jan Pauls faces off against a Republican challenger who's a pro-choice, pro-gay rights railroad conductor named Dakota Bass. There's no way I'm not spending the entire night talking about this race. I am. I called it. What do you mean you called it? I just told you about it. Did you call it? I... No. I did call... Okay. You know, one of the most interesting things is even the best newscasters out there, the Walter Cronkites of our time on whatever network it is you watch, CNN or Fox News or whatever, all those guys, I mean, a lot of the guys I've met and talked to are underneath the table, you know, texting their friends silly jokes. I wanted Elliot to have that. Like, I wanted him to be really interested in his Twitter followers and interested in his brand. And I like that aspect in a show where so many of the people were interested in the integrity of, you know, broadcasting and the integrity of, you know, journalism. I wanted the, the other side of it, which is that there's a lot in journalism that is entertainment and that is um, not well-intentioned by any means and is uh, narcissistic and... And I really wanted to play that. Uh, and I think I got some of that in there. And Aaron, you know, was interested in some of that. But in general, it was a show sort of like the West Wing. Into Aaron's very interested in this almost idealized version of people with a lot of integrity in politics and in journalism. And I also see a different brand of person in politics and journalism. And I really wanted to do that. So I did as much as I could. But, uh, but yeah, it wasn't a lot. 
This is what I'm talking about. Women and closets. What about men in showers? I've got an awesome shower. I love my shower. Where is she keeping her clothes in the meantime? My closet. Well, where are you keeping your clothes? The shower. Oh, dude. Aaron is a brilliant guy, and he's a guy who clearly in college would write his papers right before they were due <laughs> because there would be days where I think I would talk to him too, where we'd have a table read. I'd be like, you know, how's it going? You'd table read in two days or something. He'd be like, that's good. I got to go home and, uh, you know, write 70 pages of the script, but it's, but it's good. <laughs> it's like, great, man. Good luck with that. And, you know, I think we even did have like, a week or two of shutdowns while he was working. But I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for that because I even look at the Duffer Brothers and Stranger Things Now or I look at Aaron and it really is a single, he did have a writer's room and they contribute a lot, but it really is a very singular voice, his shows and his movies. And so he is doing a lot of the writing and it's incredibly hard to write simply a one hour of a television show, but to produce eight to 10 episodes, 12 episodes of a television show is like, it's just really hard. So I have a lot of sympathy for that. And they also were very intense. The script supervisors and the producers were very intense about your saying of the dialogue exactly as the dialogue was written. And that's a unique thing. A lot of shows and movies that I work on They'll be like, yeah, if you say something generally along those lines, like, we're good. There's one like, I had a mini monologue early on, and it was something like, you know, it was like half a page of like me like going at this thing. And then we did a take, and the script supervisor came over, and she was like, it's, um, it's not someone, it's somebody. And I was like, man, in the middle of the speech, like, you just want me to focus on like someone, someone. So, I mean, it was very technical in that way. Uh, it was, they were very, they loved his words and they didn't want you to change a single one of them. The musicality was a part of it. So that was very unique to that particular production. End of Watch. That movie in particular was a nutty experience for all of us. I think the movie turned out very well to the credit of David Ayer and also Jake really threw himself into it. One day the LAPD is going to bend you over your black and white and they are going to f you up the ass. They are going to f you so long and so hard you're going to want to eat your gun just to make it stop and if if you don't eat your gun and the f somehow magically stops <laughs> They're going to give you freeway therapy. We did a lot of police training. We really um, went deep into this cop world. We did. We did also did the you know the PT type stuff that they do when they're recruits. We also got tasered, as all police recruits do. They get tasered and pepper sprayed, so they know what it feels like. We didn't get pepper sprayed, but we got tasered, and I will tell you that is a very unpleasant experience. You kids have fun out there. The LAPD's got a big You got a big heart. Thank you for sharing that. Can't wait to get it up the air. In a sense, it probably adds to the flavor of the movie. And also there were real gang members. A lot of the extras were real gang members that uh, David sort of you know, knew in a certain way. A lot of the cops in the movie are real cops. And there's a certain value to, to that um, in terms of my particular process there was little value. Um, I think there is a metaphoric aspect to what we do that really does not translate to real life. I mean, there's a great like Stoppard quote in Rosencrantz Guildenstern where the head actor comes out and says, we're actors, we're the opposite of people. And I do feel like it's kind of true. Like me walking around as a policeman what I'll bring to it is something personal from my life that can metaphorically relate to the policeman. But me actually doing police stuff, I can understand in a certain way, but going too deep into it doesn't make much sense because I don't have a relationship to policing in that way. Oh, so would you uh, call for a rescue? Don't move. Do not move. What do you look like? Where do you go? Northbound through the houses. Hispanic male, blue checkered shirt. It's just a weird thing where sometimes directors and productions get into the realism of things so much that we, they lose sight of the fact that I have no relationship to that particular realism. What I have a relationship to is my personal metaphoric relationship to that. 
in certain ways, it's useful to understand procedure, but it's really about a scripted character. And so there's a weird play of those things that didn't, the deeper you go into it, the less sense it makes. The Equalizer. This is a, an example of a heightened movie as opposed to End to Watch really went for a kind of realism that um, I sort of feel is better served in the documentary realm. So Equalizer is, you know, based on a TV show. It, it has entertainment value. It's kind of broader in its paint and its palette of color. And I enjoy that. Um, and yeah, Frank masters was more of a character in that way why don't you get out of here and go yourself you mother you know who the f you're dealing with huh i am a cop you moron i loved antoine fuqua i loved him and i really also i didn't get to know him as well but i really liked denzel and i really learned a lot from denzel on that movie i learned a lot that I brought with me into Stranger Things, to be honest, about a leading role in a film. There was a stillness that he had. No, fuck, all right, all right, all right, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're so nuts. In terms of Masters, he was really fun and wild to play. I mean, he was just like a loose cannon. One of the great things about Antoine, too, is there's just tons of improv. So most of the stuff that is mine in the movie is improv. The whole scene with me and Denzel where he he's handcuffed me and I'm yelling at him, was that, was all, that wasn't even in the script. And I even said to Antoine after we shot it, I was like, that's not going in the movie. He's like, that's going in the movie. I was like, okay. You know what, f you, you mother f You have f me so f bad. You did this, you mother f You hate yourself. You did it to this badge, man. Right? disrespected his badge, you understand me? And also that character was an exercise in how many times and how many different ways I could say the word f Antoine would say to me, he'd go like, oh man, it's like musical when you say, I'm like, you f f you f don't f on it. F you, you mother f I got nothing, all right? I got f nothing, you hear me? I got f nothing because you- Just as many times as I possibly could. Uh, I really liked that as well, it was fun.